Hey, you guys, gals, and bums. And welcome back to A Few Bad Men. All right, today, I'm going to give you a little something. You know, I, if I got time, I like to give you something during the week. All right, today, I got a nice little special one for you. I got Mickey Duffy. All right, now, Mickey Duffy is the true life Mickey Doyle from, from Boardwalk Empire. That's who they based the character on. All right, but before we get into this, I need you to hit that subscribe button, all right? Not just hit him. I need you to hit him, and I need you to leave the body in the open so everybody knows that it was us. Few bad men gang, okay? Can you do that? You gotta, you gotta make your bones, all right? Get your button, all right? Mickey Duffy was born on September 8th, 1888 in the Grays Ferry section of Philadelphia to Polish immigrant parents. His given name was either Michael Joseph Cusick or William Michael Cusick. And like a lot of criminals of his time, he changed his name to gain acceptance from the Irish gangs and politicians who ran Philadelphia at the time. He tried out a few Irish pseudonyms, including John Murphy and George McEwen before settling on Mickey Duffy. As a youngster, Mickey was involved in petty crimes, but soon graduated to more serious offenses, including armed robbery and hijacking. His friends said that there's one thing about Mickey, he never ran away from a fight. He's always ready to defend himself, and there wasn't a shade of coward in him. Mickey quickly rose through the ranks to become one of Philadelphia's most notorious gangsters. His first arrest came in 1908, and throughout his lifetime, he would serve jail time for a variety of offenses. Mickey was arrested in May of 1919 for assault and battery with the intent to kill, which earned him a two year vacation at Eastern State Penitentiary. Now by the time Mickey came home from the slammer, prohibition was in full swing. Gangsters across the country were raking in millions and Mickey was determined to get his share. Mickey easily found his way into the world of booze smuggling, bootlegging, and brewing. He operated several breweries in Philadelphia, Camden, and South Jersey. All right, now there's a guy named Max Bubuhoff. All right, he was a fight manager, and he controlled bootlegging in Philadelphia in the mid-20s until a 1928 grand jury closed in on Hoff, ending his career as Philadelphia's booze baron. With Hoff gone, Duffy took over the city of Brotherly Love's illicit beer racket. And Mickey's propensity for gaining power at a gunpoint brought him to conflict with a Reading-based bootlegger named Max Hassel, who was with Waxy Gordon, and they controlled numerous breweries in the Pennsylvania and North Jersey area. Now, if you, ain't, if you don't know who Waxy Gordon is, you need to go and check that Waxy Gordon video out. Okay, we do a whole workup on Maxi Go on, on Waxy Gordon and, and Max Hassel. <clears throat> okay? You need to go check that out. I'll leave a tag for you. Now, Mickey was aggressive and he elbowed his way into the rich Jersey territory. Max Hassel handed him over a brewery. Now, Mickey was partnered up with some big names at the time. Like I said, Max Hassel, who was partnered with Waxy Gordon. Also, there was a guy named Harry Green. James Richardson, Charles Bodine, and Nicholas Delmore. He would be in frequent conflict with rival gangs such as the Hoffs and the Bailey Brothers throughout the decade. All right, with thousands of dollars in profit rolling in, Mickey opened up a few nightclubs, including the fashionable Club Cadix at 23rd and Chestnut Streets in Philadelphia in 1924. And he ran his bootlegging and numbers business from the old Ritz Carlton Hotel. Everybody in Philly knew Mickey. But being a bootlegger was a hazardous occupation and Mickey found that out the hard way. Late on the night of February 25th, 1927, Mickey was leaving the club Caddox with his bodyguard, John Bricker, when shots rang out from a Thompson submachine gun, the first time this weapon was used in Philadelphia. Becker fell to the ground mortally wounded and the club doorman was seriously 
injured and Mickey was hit several times. He was taken to Hahnemann Hospital where he was given last rites. Newspaper stories at the time report that Mickey was not expected to live, but he was back to his gangster ways within a few weeks after the shooting. The gunman was said to have been Peter Ford and Francis Bailey, members of a rival bootlegging gang headed by Bailey and his two brothers, James and Harry. Mickey was pulling in so much dough from his rackets that he had a Mediterranean style mansion built for him and his wife Edith. Built by McWilliams and Maloney, it looked like a Mediterranean villa. The structure was white with green satyrs on the side and black painted palm trees on the facade. A visitor would enter through a stone patio covered in the summer with a large bright colored awning. Now, although the Duffies had a spectacular home, what they really wanted was to have children, but, but they couldn't. So one day, Mickey decided to satisfy his wife by adopting a baby. He went to the orphan's house to apply, but his application was denied. They tried to make up for not having children by donating to orphanages. Mickey would buy hundreds of tickets to sporting and entertainment events and give them away to the poor. In 1930, John Finiello, a federal prohibition agent, was killed while conducting a raid on one of Mickey's breweries in Elizabeth, New Jersey. This caused the law to clamp down on Mickey's operations. And sometime after this, a rift developed between Mickey and some of his associates, including his new bodyguard and chauffeur, Joseph Beatty. Throughout his life, Mickey Duffy was known as a hoodlum, racketeer, bear baron, ex-con, gangster, bootlegger, hijacker, thief, and smuggler. In 1930, he was dubbed King of the Numbers Racket by Philadelphia District Attorney John Monahan. And for a brief time, he was known as public enemy number one in Philly. His lavish lifestyle included his magnificent home, fancy cars, fashionable clothes, and flashy jewels for his wife. He lived the life of a crime big shot, and he apparently made some enemies along the way. On August 30th, 1931, while sleeping at his suite at the Ambassador Hotel in Atlantic City, Mickey Duffy was murdered. There was speculation that he was killed by his own associates in an attempt to seize his power and business. Although police investigated the murder and had an array of suspects, no one was ever charged with the murder. The funeral of Mickey Duffy was a big deal. Thousands of people lined the streets to see his funeral procession. Police turned away spectators and only family and friends with a special pass were allowed to enter. The next day, a 31 car procession accompanied Duffy's body to Mount Morrow Cemetery where he was reportedly buried in a solid bronze coffin. After the burial, souvenir hunters removed flowers from the hundreds of floral tributes left at the gravesite. When he died, Mickey's personal estate was valued at only $6,000. Administrative papers showed $5,000 worth of personal property and 1,000 equity in a home on Osage Avenue in Philadelphia. In 1932, several tax liens were levied against the estate and in 1933, the funeral director who buried Mickey sued the estate to recover the funeral costs. Unfortunately, by that time, Mickey's wife, Edith, could not be located. Now, even though no one was ever charged with the murder of Mickey Duffy, the streets have a way of dealing with things on their own. So two months later, in December, two men, Samuel E. Grossman and Albert Scale, were gunned down as they sat in the office of their second-story gambling and drinking resort the Jewish Social Club. It was located at the southeast corner of Gerard Avenue and Watt Street. Sam and Al were former lieutenants in Mickey Duffy's gang. Both Grossman and Scale had been picked up as material witnesses and were currently out on bail. As, as Grossman sat at the desk and Scale sat on top of the desk, they must have been divvying up the night's receipts because Grossman had $1,000 in his hand when five men entered the club and headed directly for the office. The police were quick to respond. When they entered the office, they found Grossman killed over the desk and that grand tuck tight in his hand 
and a gun in the other. His eyes were glazed over, but they didn't want to take any chances. The cop kicked the gun from his hand. Scare was blown off the desk and found floundering on the floor with $400 in small bills and an ever-increasing puddle of his own blood. Who shot you, the cop asked. Screw that. I don't know. Get me out of here. Grossman was questioned, but either couldn't or wouldn't respond. Both men were taken to the hospital where they died a short time later. And that, my friends, is the straight dope on Mickey Duffy. The real life Mickey Doyle from Boardwalk Empire. I hope you guys enjoyed the story as much as I enjoyed telling it. Make sure you whack that damn subscribe button and leave him somewhere public so everybody knows it was us. Okay? Break that thumb. Hit that bell so you know when the next video's coming. I might drop a surprise on you at any time. You never know. Just like this. All right? Make sure you go to the merch store. Get yourself something nice. Get your girl something nice. Get your guy something nice. All right? I'll leave it in the comments. All right? This is a few bad men. Keep your nose clean. And don't take any wooden nickels. I see you in the funnies.